Hello and welcome to the December webinar from the IEA Clean Coal Center. My name is Benedicta and I'm the communications officer here. Our monthly webinars are based on our technical reports which are available from our website www.iea-coal.org. Residents of member countries and employees of sponsoring organizations can download our reports at no charge after a one-off registration. The subject for today's webinar is The Outlook for CCS in the Coal Sector, presented by Toby Lockwood. Here you go, Toby. Thank you, Benedicto. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on CCS in the Coal Sector. Um, I'll start with a little introduction. Around 10 years ago, CCS and clean coal were almost synonymous, but the, the place for coal in the political and indus industry narrative surrounding CCS has recently been on the wane, despite something of a resurgence in, uh, in interest in CCS generally. In this presentation, I'm, I aim to examine this trend and look at why we still need to be talking about CCS for coal and see where there may be opportunities for CCS deployment in the sector. While the majority of the talk focuses on coal power, I will also touch on the role for coal in other applications of CCS, such as coal to hydrogen. So let's begin by reminding ourselves of the case for CCS in the coal power sector. The International Energy Agency's two degrees scenario, a lower, a lower cost pathway to limiting global warming to two degrees by 2060, has CCS contributing 14% to the greenhouse gas reductions necessary relative to a reference case. Um, over half of the CO2 captured in this scenario is from the power sector and half of the installed CCS capacity uh, in 2060 is on gas generation and half on coal, that is around 320 gigawatts each. It shouldn't be too surprising that such large quantities of CCS are required in the coal power sector. Currently coal is the largest single contributor to global power generation with over 2 terawatts of installed capacity and represents around a third of global CO2 emissions. Around half of this capacity is less than 15 years old, so it will continue emitting for at least another 20 years if allowed to complete its design lifetime. As much of this recently built capacity is in developing economies in Asia with growing power demand, it's unlikely these, these assets will be shut prematurely. According to the Platts Power Plant database, another 192 gigawatts under construction and 300 gigawatts in various stages of planning, it's clear that CCS will be required to address the emissions of existing coal generation, let alone the inevitable growth of new plants in Asia and Africa. In stark contrast to the ambitious IEA scenario we've just seen is the actual rate of CCS deployment over the last few years. This data from the Global CCS Institute shows the gradual increase in the megatons of CO2 captured per year by operating CCS projects and those currently under construction. Uh, the leap upwards in uh, next year is due to the Gorgon LNG project in Australia, which will store up to 4 gigatons of CO2 per year once CO2 injection commences. This is scheduled for next year following some delay. Gorgon is representative of the majority of CCS projects to date, which are mostly related to the necessary and relatively low-cost process of removing CO2 from natural gas. There are only two large projects operating on coal power plant, and none in an advanced stage of development. Most worryingly, following years of slow but steady deployment of CCS, there are now very few projects of any kind on the immediate horizon. This can be partly attributed to a lull in political interest in CCS and climate change following the global economic crisis. Now some countries have expressed renewed support for CCS and target new projects for the mid-2020s, which are not shown here, but some of them will be discussed later. So the figure on the left highlights the dominance of the oil and gas industry in CCS activity to date. Not only is CO2 separation an inherent part of many gas processing operations, these industries are relatively strong revenue streams to support investment and, importantly, the subsurface expertise required to develop geological CO2 storage. Nearly all CCS projects operating today are also associated with injection of CO2 for enhanced oil recovery, which provides a vital revenue stream in the absence of policy incentives for CO2 storage. The thriving demand for CO2 for EOR in the North American oil industry has led to a clustering of CCS projects in that region, shown in the map of large projects on the right. However, revenue from CO2 sales 
to the oil industry does not usually meet the entire cost of capturing CO2 from power plants. Of the five non-EOR projects operating where CO2 is stored in saline aquifer formations, four are also initiatives led by oil and gas companies. So where is the place for coal and the power sector generally in all of this? Once upon a time, around 10 years ago to be precise, it was generally recognised that coal power was the key target for CCS research efforts and funding. A host of coal-related projects were proposed all over the world, many of them ending in gen, only for most to come to nothing. Despite around $30 billion in capital funding being made available by governments in the period around 2008 to 2010, most of this went unspent as projects failed to meet deadlines or find additional sources of funding or proved more complex than anticipated. More fundamentally, there was an absence of mechanisms which could provide positive revenue streams for a CCS power project. So what kind of policies could provide an incentive for investment in CCS then? Numerous forms of CO2 pricing exist in jurisdictions around the world, including emissions trading systems such as those in the EU and parts of North America and China. Although the prices found in these systems are usually insufficient to drive CCS investment, a, a two-for-one offer on the Alberta CO2 credit system played a key role in investment in Shell's tar sand-based Quest project. A significant tax on CO2 emissions from the offshore oil and gas sector in Norway has famously driven the two non-EOR CCS projects in that country. In the US, a tax credit directly linked to the quantity of CO2 stored is a particularly interesting new policy for CCS, which we'll examine more later on. Some countries have also introduced absolute caps on the emission intensity of power plants. Uh, these are normally designed to rule out new coal generation in favour of gas power, but in some circumstances may encourage CCS. Power plants also have recourse to power price-based mechanisms, which other industries lack. Guaranteed wholesale power prices such as feed-in tariffs, ultimately funded by electricity consumers, have been widely used for driving renewables deployment. In the UK, a similar mechanism called a contract for difference was opened up to propose CCS plants with prices agreed by bilateral negotiation, but relatively high price demands contributed to these projects failing to take off. Also an imitation of a renewable incentive, portfolio standards for CCS power have been proposed in the US, in which uh, retail power companies are obliged to buy a portion of their power from CCS power plants. In the face of industry and consumer opposition, um, people more willing to subsidise renewables than CCS, such schemes have also not been successful. It's clear that CCS and the power sector face a number of challenges. Unlike many oil and gas industry processes, CO2 and coal flue gas is relatively dilute and more costly to capture, both in terms of capital equipment and energy demand. Revenues from power sales are typically regulated in, in many regions, operating hours of thermal plant have declined as more renewables have come online. The lack of subsurface expertise in the power industry means that complex joint ventures with other companies are usually required to deal with storage, leading to problems of counterparty risk relating to CO2 offtake. CO2 prices are only an effective driver in so much as they can boost the power sale revenue of CCS equipped plants by pushing up wholesale power prices. However, with other low carbon sources on the grid, power prices are less affected by CO2 prices and there is less potential for clean plants to reap the benefits of their investment. On top of this, CO2 price, prices in emissions trading systems in particular are unpredictable, and even CO2 taxes face political uncertainty. All this points to the likely need for more targeted CCS incentives, such as premium power prices or credits per tonne of CO2 stored. We're now going to take a look, um, an obligatory look at the projects which have managed to overcome these hurdles and get full-scale CCS operating on a coal power plant. Susk Power's pioneering Boundary Dam power plant in Saskatchewan, Canada, was the first of these in 2014. Originally a 140 megawatt lignite unit, it was substantially upgraded with a new turbine, turbine and boiler and uh, had Shell Cansol's amine-based technology added to provide both flue gas desulfurization and CO2 capture. The entire project cost around 1.1 billion US dollars, but around a third of this was on the unit upgrade rather than CO2 capture. The one megaton per year of CO2 captured is sold to EOR operations in nearby oil fields, with some injected into a saline aquifer as part of the Aquastore research project. Um, the Boundary Dam CCS project was partly driven by Canada's CO2 intensity cap of 420 grams per kilowatt hour, which even forces existing units to close once they reach a certain age. 
SAS Power was unwilling to lose all its coal assets and replace them with natural gas, his relatively volatile price would have to be reflected in consumer power prices. At the time of investment, um, and once a government capital grant was taken into account, the cost of generation of the project was equivalent to that of a new natural gas plant. SAS Power's status as a Crown Corporation and regional monopoly gave the company more room for this kind of strategic planning than might be found in a more competitive power market. Through a collaboration between SAS Power and, and the mining company BHP, some of the team behind Boundary Dam have formed the International CCS Knowledge Centre, which aims to share the experience and expertise from the first coal CCS project to help facilitate CCS deployment around the world. Two weeks ago, the centre launched a significant and detailed piece of work looking at the retrofit of CCS to SAS Power's youngest coal unit, the 300 megawatt Shand power plant, which was uh, commissioned in 1992. In contrast to Boundary Dam, uh, the study is based on Mitsubishi's CO2 capture technology and uses conventional wet flue gas desulfurization. Unlike Boundary Dam, Shand only requires minor modifications to the power plant steam cycle, but the study also finds remarkable cost savings for the capture system itself through economies of scale, modular construction, and improved plant integration. All in all, a 67% reduction in capital cost per tonne CO2 was found, and a 73% Reduction in operating maintenance and administration costs. This all resulted in, in a, an overall $45 per tonne cost of CO2 capture. This study effectively demonstrates how the cost of CCS on coal power can be brought down to fairly manageable levels in just two generations of deployment through learning by doing. Other interesting findings of the study include the use of water captured from flue gas um, to provide for the additional water consumption and an increase in capture rate to up to 97% as the power plant's load is turned down. This makes it particularly suitable for load following the province's wind generation output. Whether SAS Power will decide to invest in the SAM project remains to be seen and may depend on the details of how federal CO2 regulation is enacted in the province. The second operating coal plant with CCS and the largest to date is the Petronova project in Texas. Commissioned in early 2017, this facility uses Mitsubishi's capture technology to separate CO2 from a portion of flue gas from one unit at the WA Parish coal plant, equivalent to 240 megawatts of generating capacity. The 1.4 the megaton of CO2 captured is used in EUR at the West Ranch oil field, which crucially the project owns a 50% stake in in order to draw revenue directly from oil sales rather than the CO2 sales. In addition to a Department of Energy capital grant, the involvement of JX Nippon and Mitsubishi allowed the project to access additional risk-tolerant financing from a Japanese export credit agency. NRG, like SAS Power, NRG projects significant cost reductions for a second plant, but have no current plans to invest. Uh, this slide shows a close-up of the huge rectangular CO2 absorber at Petronova and also a schematic of how MHI would scale up the process with horizontal addition of similarly sized modules. So although the US has experienced its fair share of CCS project cancellations, including the, the Kemper County IGCC project, which was actually constructed, uh, the US is undoubtedly a world leader in CCS. There are eight projects operating in addition to Petronova across coal gasification, hydrogen production, bioethanol production, and natural gas processing. Including Petronova, three of these successful projects have been assisted by Department of Energy grants, and all but the Illinois Industrial Bioethanol Project have sold CO2 to EOR. Since 2008, the 45Q regulation has granted companies storing CO2 with a tax credit of $12 per tonne of CO2 stored for EOR and $22 per tonne for storage in saline aquifers. However, there was a cap on the total amount of CO2 which could be claimed for under this regulation. In a hugely significant move for CCS in the US, 45Q was revamped earlier this year to remove the cap and grant up to $35 per tonne and $50 per tonne for, for EUR and saline storage, respectively, provided projects can start construction before 2024. The details of this tax regulation are currently being hammered out by the Internal Revenue Service, but there are indications that it will drive a new wave of investment in CCS in the US. The figure on the right indicates major emitters and storage regions in the US, as well as ideas for potential CO2 trunk lines, which could be used to connect the major emitting regions to the areas of EOR activity. So some analysis by the DOE shown here suggests that 45Q 
queue could trigger fairly significant investment in CCS and new coal plant, uh, in new, in, in, even in new coal plant with CCS, leading to overall growth in coal generation, just shown on the right. The plot on the left um, shows growth in power plant capacity with CCS with a reference scenario without 45Q in the leftmost bar. That as implemented 45Q scenario with the construction deadline in the middle bar and on the right, there's uh, the rightmost bar is a scenario where the, the deadline for construction is removed. Both the 45Q scenarios are dominated by new coal with CCS uh, and full capture. These same scenarios are also expressed in terms of overall coal generation in the right-hand plot. However, most initial investment is likely to be related to lower cost capture processes such as bioethanol plant and uh, also coupled, coupled with EOR. Occidental, a major EOR operator in the US, have stated amb ambitious plans to expand CO2 capture operations and have already agreed to capture CO2 from two bioethanol plants owned by White Energy. The Lake Charles methanol plant is an existing proposal in Louisiana, uh, which may also go ahead due to, new credit, uh, due to the new credit that's uh, producing methanol from gasified pet coke. So turning now to Europe, the story of CCS over the last decade has been even more littered with failed ambitions and there are still no large projects operating aside from Norway's Sleipner and Snowvid gas facilities. In the coal sector, the Netherlands road project at the high efficiency muscle act power plant in Rotterdam was cancelled last year in the face of, um, face of a strong political movement to phase out coal in any form. In the UK, the White Rose project was cancelled in 2015 following the withdrawal of government capital funding for CCS. Other coal projects in Spain, Poland, and Italy made even less progress. For the countries bordering the North Sea, where good quality CO2 storage can be found, CCS is still on the political agenda, but in a reimagined form. The focus has shifted from coal power generation and individual large projects uh, to, a fo to a focus on clusters of emitting industries and shared transport and storage infrastructure. This is typified by the, the Porthos project in Rotterdam, shown on the right, where the Port Authority plans to develop a CO2 pipeline, it's marked in, in blue on the, uh, in the image, and, uh, and also develop the storage site in the North Sea, into which several emitters can tap into at their discretion. In Norway, there's a plan to collect CO2 from a waste incineration plant and a cement plant by ship um, before sending it by pipeline to storage in the North Sea. In the UK, there is uh, also a recognised need for a large emitter to anchor industrial clusters. This large emitter could be a, a gas power plant, although coal is no longer on the table, uh, a gas to hydrogen or a gas to hydrogen plant. In general, there is growing interest in using CCS to generate clean hydrogen from fossil fuels, which can then be used to decarbonise heating or transport. Europe has struggled with CCS in the past as there has been opposition to onshore storage and limited options for EOR. Originally meant to drive deployment, the CO2 price in the EU ETS has been too low over the last 10 years. Whilst it's now recovering, it's unlikely to drive CCS investment alone, and governments will need to play a greater role in, in backing risks involved in offshore infrastructure development in particular. Another growing area of interest in Europe is, bio, is um, bioenergy with CCS or BECS, in which uh, emissions from biomass combustion are captured and stored in order to obtain negative CO2 emissions. This kind of CO2 removal technology, rather than just abatement, is thought to be vital to attaining our climate goals. Drax Power Plant in the UK, which has converted four large coal units to 100% biomass, is constructing a small capture facility for biomass flue gas that could scale up if the UK's CCS policy ambitions come to fruition. Although this plant is phasing out coal use entirely, there's undoubtedly an opportunity for some negative emissions to be achieved at low cost by co-firing coal with a percentage of biomass. Now I'm going to turn to China, a giant of coal power that must be at the forefront of any ambitions for CCS to make a difference to global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, China has actively pursued CCS research since around 2007, leading to some significant large-scale tests of domestic capture technologies, uh, including the commercial facilities such as uh, commercial facilities such as the Shidongku plant in Shanghai, pictured here, which supplied CO2 to the welding industry. 
A handful of medium-sized projects, also incorporating geological storage, have been driven by enhanced oil recovery, mostly sourcing CO2 from China's booming coal to chemicals industry or natural gas processing. Um, well, there's one saline aquifer project, which is completed by Shenhua, now China Energy, at the Rordos Coal to Liquid Facility in Shanxi Province. As elsewhere, numerous plans for full-scale demonstration of CCS at a coal power plant, many of, many of which were backed by inter international initiatives, have stalled for want of sufficient policy support. The Yanchang CCUS project pictured here is a coal to methanol facility operating a small EOR test, which was planning to scale up to, to uh, significant capture levels of 410,000 tonnes per year. However, recent indications suggest this may be realised at smaller scale now, and there are no definite large projects currently in the pipeline. So there, there are some small-scale coal power-based projects active in China. Since 2010, the oil company Sinopec has, used, uh, four, has taken 4,000 tonnes per year of CO2 from its own Shengli power plant for enhanced oil recovery. The major energy company, China Energy, are uh, currently constructing a fairly significant capture facility at the Jinzhou power plant in Shanxi province and will inject the CO2 into the same saline aquifer formation as the Ordos project I just mentioned. In Guangdong province, power utility China Resources Power will be commissioning a large test facility for, for both solvent and membrane capture technologies at their Haifeng power plant next year, with potential for scale up if tests are successful. Both Shanxi and Guangdong province have offered support for CCS development by easing permitting and even offering increased operating hours to the Haifeng plant. At over 950 gigawatts of installed capacity, China's coal fleet represents almost half global coal capacity. However, with an average age of around 12 years and a significant uh, proportion of large high efficiency units with stringent polluting controls, this fleet should also include many ideal candidates for CCS retrofit. In addition to the generally lower costs of, uh, of manufacturing in China compared to Europe and North America, the scale of the coal fleet suggests uh, there's a lot of opportunity to reduce costs through learning by doing a mass production of post-combustion capture units in a modular fashion. A recent report completed by the Clean Coal Centre for the IEA's Coal Industry Advisory Board looks at costs of retrofit to 1,000 megawatt units in China. The map on the right shows how these units are located relative to suitable storage. It can be seen there is a shortage of onshore storage in the south of the country, although offshore storage is available in this region and is currently being investigated further. Costs in the CIB study are partly based on recent analysis by the IEA Greenhouse Gas Program, which examines costs of a reference 1,000 megawatt CCS plant in various locations. The figure shows that the two Chinese locations considered are the lowest costs due primarily to lower material and labor costs. Our analysis considers retrofit of a 1,000 megawatt USC unit in the period 2025 to 2030 and finds a levelised cost of electricity of uh, 410 to 460 yuan per megawatt hour across various sensitivity cases, which is well below the tariffs currently available for wind power. Given that China is introducing a power sector-wide CO2 emissions trading system from 2020, the effect of CO2 price was also considered finding a, a price in excess of 215 yuan per, per tonne could make a retrofit profitable. Yeah, that should read CNY per, per ton on that slide. Um, or a 45% increase in power tariff could also render the project profitable. The aforementioned uh, average CO2 intensity limit of 550 gram per kilowatt hour at large power companies is, is challenging to achieve and may also play a role in driving CCS retrofit to some of these companies' fleets. In 2015, the Asian Development Bank and China's National Development and Reform Commission produced a roadmap for CCS rollout, which offers a realistic projection of how CCS deployment could proceed in the country. The first phase of lower-cost deployment of coal to chemicals projects combined with UR is followed by retrofit of suitable power units from around 2030 onwards. Australia is another country which has pursued an interest in CCS since the early days of the technology, uh, building up an extensive research base and some large test facilities for both capture and, capture and storage, 
such as the Calide Oxyfield project and the Otway CO2 storage project. However, as for most regions, large power sector projects have struggled to progress beyond the design stage. There are two notable new CCS projects in Australia involving coal. In Victoria, a project led by Kawasaki and funded by both the Japanese and Australian governments is aiming to gasify the state's brown coal to hydrogen before shipping it to Japan. Uh, this project is starting with small-scale tests on uh, gasification uh, and, sh and hydrogen handling, which I think should begin uh, in 2020. Um, although not part of the current test, it's envisaged that the CO2 from this process could be stored by the existing carbon net project, which has uh, characterized and carried out regulatory procedures for offshore storage in the Gippsland Basin. In Queensland, a Glencore subsidiary known as the Carbon Transport and Storage Company, or CTSCO, is developing CO2 storage in the Surat Basin. So the Surat Basin is of interest as a storage site, as there are several large emitters in the area, and there's uh, a large quantity of suitable um, saline aquifer storage. The emitters include several gas power plants and the 850 megawatt supercritical Milmerin coal plant. Um, on the storage side, CTSCO is characterising a formation on Glencore land known as the Precipice Sandstone and aims to inject 60,000 tonnes of CO2 over three years. On the capture side, CTSCO hopes to construct a 100,000 tonne per year capture pilot at Milmarin Power Plant, which is actually a majority owned by Huanang Group, a Chinese power company with its own post-combustion capture technology. The new capture plant will be based on Huanang's 120,000 tonne per year facility at Shidonku, which I mentioned earlier. The feed study for this project was recently completed and the final investment decision is expected next year. The capture and, uh, capture and storage projects have received funding from the Australian Coal Industries Coal 21 Fund, but will also require a portion of government funding to proceed. So to summarise, despite all the current interest in CCS and other CO2 emitting sources, the need for CCS on the enormous global coal power fleet has not gone away and remains in nearly all pathways to limiting global warming to 2 degrees or below. Although progress in demonstrating CCS in the power sector has been slow, the two projects we do have have already helped point the way to major cost reductions for the next phase of deployment. For that next phase to take place, policy innovation is required both to provide viable revenue streams to cover CCS costs and reasonably apportioned risks between government emitters and CO2 storers. The 45Q policy in the US stands out as a CTS targeted action which could really drive deployment forward even in the coal power sector, although initial development is likely to occur on lower cost capture sources. In Europe, meanwhile, there is a strong drive to focus on more politically and publicly acceptable emitters such as clusters of manufacturing industries and clean hydrogen production from gas. However, in the UK, it is recognised that power plants of some form may still be the easiest first movers. The scale of China's coal power emissions are a daunting prospect, but also a potential major opportunity for CCS, where costs could be driven down through economies of scale in manufacturing. Whilst there is gradual growth in CCS activity in China and some useful policy mechanisms coming into force in 2020, there still appears to be uncertain political backing at the national level. So I'm going to conclude with some brief thoughts on the position of coal and the ongoing development of CCS. It's clear that despite some success, the slow progress in CCS has become associated with 10 years of primarily focusing on coal power. Advocates of stronger policy action on CCS have also sought to dissociate the technology from power generation in general, where it is inevitably drawn into unfavourable comparisons of renewable energy sources. In reality, both technologies will be required to decarbonise the power sector in many regions. Fortunately, some new developments in coal power with CCS are emerging, particularly in the US, Australia and China. These projects will be able to learn from past successes and failures in terms of technical experience, but more importantly, with respect to successful commercial structures and policies. The general movement towards separating the business of transporting and storing CO2 from capture will relieve the burden of managing and funding large infrastructure projects from, em from emitters and allow power plants to focus on capturing CO2. At the same time, the large and reliable volumes of CO2 supplied by power plants can help justify uh, investment in infrastructure. Finally, coal can still play a role in, the two growing in two growing interest areas. 
Negative emissions can, um, can still be achieved, but at lower costs and with greater fuel flexibility through co-firing by biomass and coal. Using CCS to generate clean hydrogen from fossil fuels is, is potentially a vital route to decarbonising the transport and heating sectors in many regions. Whilst in Europe the focus is currently on methane reforming, we've seen that Australia and Japan are making progress on using low-rank coal as a cheap source of this valuable clean fuel. So I'm going to finish with a, a short plug for our um, Clean Coal Technology Conference, which is taking place in Houston next June. The deadline for abstract submission is next week. Uh, this is a, a, an international event which covers um, clean use of coal generally, including high efficiency plants, CCS, pollutant controls, um, and biomass co-firing. And the website's there where you can submit abstracts or find out more. Uh, importantly, there's two site visits, one to the, the Petronova plant, which we, which we spoke about today, and also to Net Power's uh, pilot of um, a rather revolutionary CCS technology, which could, uh, has potential to dramatically lower costs. You can find out more on the website. With that, I'll hand over to Benedicta, I think, to deal with, deal with questions. <coughs> Thank you, Toby. Uh, yeah, we have one question here. So, Shall I read it? I'll read it. How much does CCS premium cost in terms of STCO2 or S, um, the dollars per tons of CO2 or dollars per megawatt hours. Uh, does this compare with the cost of CCGT without CCS? With respect to UK standards where the CO2 cap on new plants seem to favour unabated CCGT. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I'll just... Um we did that again. So how much does the CCS premium cost in terms of dollars per ton of CO2, uh, and how does this compare with the cost of CCGT with, without CCS? Well, obviously, I mean, this comparison is often made, uh, and it's kind of a false one because, of course, a CCGT is, is, is going to be cheaper than anything with CCS. Um, I mean, the real comparison is between coal with with CCS and, and gas with CCS, um, and in some regions gas wins, in some regions coal wins. Um, the UK has recently decided to focus on gas with CCS partly because it's come out as lower on a dollar per megawatt hour basis. Uh, it tends not to come out lower on a dollar per, per ton CO2 basis because gas plants produce less CO2, but um, the government's perhaps rightly concluded that that's not the best uh, um, metric to use in this in this sense. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're just using the, uh, the CO2 intensity cap, um, which is set to allow gas plants and not coal plants, of course, uh, a gas plant is likely to, to win uh, in regions, in any region where uh, the gas price is reasonable. Uh, of course, in Asia, where gas prices are much higher, um, the uh, a coal plant with CCS may start to compete, especially with lower uh, manufacturing costs um, for the capture plant. So yeah, really, it really depends on region and, and gas price. But uh, I think, on the face of it, it's difficult to um, to beat an unabated plant. And we have to remember that CCGT plants still are still emitting quite a lot of CO2. Um, and uh, a, a, any kind of CCS plant is, is going to be is going to have a much lower CO2 intensity. Um, so maybe I'll read out the next question. Um, how much energy would need with a carbon capture installation require on a 200 megawatt coal-fired unit? And what would the enthalpy of the supply steam be? Um, well, this is, this is quite a technical question, um, and we've done a lot of other work on this kind of thing. But um, 
the the energy penalty is is going to be uh, I mean it depends hugely on the type of plant, uh, but it's going to be around uh, a quarter of the output at the moment. Um, regard to entropy, the, the steam is normally taken from the um, uh, outlet of the intermediate pressure turbine. I think if you really want to, um, and, and often it needs to be pressure needs to be adjusted slightly um, with some modification. I think if you really want to look into that kind of thing, you should definitely look at the Shand uh, feasibility study, which I mentioned earlier on in the talk, which goes into some detail on how the power plant is integrated with the capture plant. So there's another question that's come in. Uh, do you have any view on the technologies to be used for new or retrofitted coal plants in the coming years? Do you think they'll be focused on chemical absorption as boundary dam, shand, and other projects? Or do you think that emerging technologies such as fuel cells could have a significant role? Um, I think there's a general shift in thinking in the, in the CCS community to that we should really be focusing more on chemical absorption because it has been uh, proven at scale and there's quite an urgency to deploy CCS at this point uh, when you think about the long lead times for these projects. So uh, I think there's definitely um, a priority to get many more of these um, solvent-based processes, even using the existing solvents we have, the, the, the commercial solvents we have available now, such as MHI and, and Cantol. I think there's some urgency to get uh, those solvents um, deployed more widely uh, and emerging technologies, sure, I mean, fuel cells, uh, as well as the, the net power project I, I briefly mentioned at the end, could look like they could uh, make a bit of a step change. A lot of other processes seem to be offering quite incremental gains that may struggle to compete with uh, optimization of solvent processes. Um, and for things like fuel cells, I mean, they're currently at a pilot scale and, um, you know, it's going to be maybe another decade before we get large-scale projects. So, um, yeah, they're not an immediate solution and we certainly shouldn't wait around for these technologies to... Um, we shouldn't wait for these technologies before deploying CCS more widely. Um, so I've got another question here. Do you think CCS can be applied anywhere in the world or only in certain regions? I, mean, I think the biggest factor here is um, availability of storage. It does seem like storage is rather widely available, uh, particularly in regions where it's needed, uh, such as the US and, and China. Uh, there may be some regions with less um, promising storage. I think India and South Africa are slightly less, but I'm, a, I'm, an, I'm not a geologist. Uh, I think these regions also need greater characterization. So at the moment, um, we need to uh, yeah, carry out more characterization work, I'd imagine, for, for storage. Um, also, of course, there are some regions which don't, you know, which may not even require thermal power plant if they've got good hydro resources and um, other alternatives to uh, complement renewables. Uh, another question has just come in. Um, does carbon capture with EOR reduce or increase total CO2 emissions? Uh, well, all the, I mean, a lot of calculations have been done on the sort of carbon uh, life cycle of EOR. Uh, all the CO2 which is used in CO2-based enhanced oil recovery remains in the oil reservoir because any that comes out is recycled back in. Obviously, the oil that's produced produces uh, CO2 itself, whether you should take that into account in the kind of carbon abatement is a, is really um, uh, you know, a, a sort of philosophical issue. Um, but I think the, uh, I believe the overall, I can't remember the exact figures, but the overall, uh, overall there is a, a CO2 saving even when you in, uh, take into account the CO2 emissions from the oil. Um, I think that's it for questions. I think you've had quite a while to 
get them in there. So uh, I'll pass over to Benedictine. Thank you so much, Toby. The slides for this webinar are available to download from our webinar page shortly. And the next webinar for us will be in 2019 on the 16th of January on the subject Development in Co-Firing bio Biomass with Coal. And it will be presented by Singh Zhang. Thank you all for joining us today, and goodbye.